Good evening. Welcome to the sixth webinar in what's turned out to be an absolutely wonderful first webinar series presented by the Newton Conservators. As most of you probably know, Newton Conservators is a nonprofit established in 1961 that works to preserve and to maintain open space in Newton. For more information about the organization, please check out our website at newtonconservators.org. We'd love to have you become a member while you're there. New members get a Newton Trail Guide as a welcome gift. My name is Beth Wilkinson, and I'll be the moderator of this virtual event. Barbara Bates will provide technical assistance. With that business out of the way, let's turn to the important part of the evening. Joining horticultural expert Bruce Wenning for a discussion of the more common exotic woody invasive plants and why they are harmful. Bruce is the horticulturist at the Country Club. His areas of expertise include taxonomy, plant pests, and all soil dwelling arthropods. Bruce has over 15 years working with exotic invasive plant species that are common to Massachusetts. He's done that for private clients and with volunteer groups such as Newton Conservators, Mass Audubon, and Landsake. Let's learn how to fight invasive plants with Bruce. Welcome, Bruce. Um, thank you, Beth and Barbara. Uh, this is a presentation that I um, made for the, uh, the turf show in Rhode Island last year, and it sort of came out of a um, Newton Conservators uh, library presentation with Beth and with uh, Catherine Howard uh, at the library. I think it was like three or four years ago. So uh, we'll start out here. So what I'm going to do is go through all these slides. Some of them are uh, text, some of them are, are um, photographs, and I'm going to be repetitive on purpose. So at the towards the end, I'll summarize where all these exotic invasive woody traits are and why these uh, invasive woody plants that are exotic are pests to our native landscapes. I'm going to start out very simple and then I'm just going to get a little bit repetitive and I'll go right into the biology of these, these plants. Um, that you'll just have to know uh, as, a, uh, as a volunteer or, you know, a, citizen scientist type of, type of a person. So, all right, so what are exotic woody plants? Now they are aggressive non-native and they're naturalized plants imported into the United States. They some were intentionally introduced for use in agriculture, horticulture, medicine, folklore, forestry or wildlife enhancement programs. And many were introduced for botanical displays in estate gardens and arboretums. So why are they bad for our native ecosystems? There's six very important available site characteristics to consider. And uh, it's water, nutrients, space, light, a broad range of soil types. And once they're established and growing freely, the ecological damage they cause over the very long term, it can be very devastating. So when I'm talking about long-term damage of a, that these plants cause, you have to think in terms of decades. And um, if you're thinking about, like, say, an insect pest, like the hemlock lily adelgid, and you have a nice hemlock tree in your backyard, it's about 30 feet tall, and it's infested with the, with the adelgid, and you don't do anything about it, it, it could kill the tree within seven to 10 years. Um, so these exotic invasive plants, they change the fate of native plant succession. And uh, it takes maybe 50 years or longer. So this is a very long-term pest, these plants, as compared to, let's say, chestnut blight that can kill a chestnut or did kill the chestnuts within a, a season, um, once the tree is infected with it, or two seasons. Um, all right, so um, these are long-term plants and they'll, they take, you have to think in terms of decades and how they, um, uh, destroy or, or begin to, to, to degrade, I should say, our native uh, ecosystems. So the ecological damage caused by these plants, uh, that the native plant succession uh, is affected. The continuous germination, growth, and spread of these pests species contribute to the interruption 
and our overtaking of most native plant species succession. So that's the most important thing. Um, how does this happen? Well, most exotic invasive woody plants exhibit rapid growth, prolific seeding. And in time, as they grow, they create more shaded conditions than if they were not present in the first place. The shade created greatly impacts native plant species that are not shade tolerant. All right. In other words, <laughs> the increase in the invasive plant populations eventually displace the native seedlings that are partial to full shade intolerant. This action alters the affected native plant germination growth and establishment patterns of the affected or native area. So these, um, let's, say, let's use buckthorn as an example. Once it gets established at Cold Spring Park, when it's full down there with this uh, invasive. It creates so much shade on the on the understory that the overstory native plants have a very hard time seeding themselves in and continuing the, the native plant succession because too much shade has been created by um, the invasive. Uh, and also the invasive sucks up an awful lot of water and nutrients also and takes up a lot of space. And these in this kind of infestation uh, to, to alter native plant succession can take decades. So you have to keep that in mind. Here is our favorite red maple swamp in Cold Spring Park. And the end of story right there is glossy buckthorn. You can see how dense it is. Uh, this was taken a few years ago on one of Catherine Howard's uh, buckthorn poles. Okay, so native seed banks are contaminated. So when left unchecked, the presence of exotic invasive plant or plants proved to be continuous. Again, long-term source of seeds for further invasion of new areas and in reinvasion in re of the invaded area. For example, the germinating seed and growth of glossy buckthorn right here, you can see how dense that is in red on the trail there in the red maple swamp. Um, the uh, for example, the germinating seed and growth of glossy buckthorn takes up more space, water, and nutrients. And this is the killer. It creates more shade, which inhibits some light-loving native plants from becoming established. And that's a, um, a situation that's not really talked about in a lot of um, publications. So people ask me, you know, why are these plants bad? This is one of the reasons why they are very bad. So um, another thing these plants do is they alter many ecosystem processes, including but not limited to the soil fertility cycles. They add more you know, organic matter to the soil. Uh, the decomposition rates of litter layers are affected. Uh, soil erosion rates can be affected. There's all many different studies about this. Water table levels are affected. And they all affect the soil food web in their interactions in the soil from organic matter breakdown. And some exotic plants may hybridize with closely related species. Uh, some things that they're studying now is that animal population food sources are affected. So native and non-native animal populations may shift in distribution patterns and population size by favoring exotic invasive plant species as an alternative food source to our native plant foods or the native trees and shrubs. This especially occurs when species like buckthorn and Asiatic bittersweet vine reaches very high population levels. Now some common exotic woody invasives. The following are mostly commonly encountered along roadsides, abandoned fields, local nature preserves, local woodlands, golf course woodlands where I work, <laughs> and any other unmanaged open space in your community, including your backyard. So the two trees that are common are Norway maple and tree of heaven. Now, Norway maple was a big street tree and still is in Newton. They were planted probably back in the 50s and the 60s. And um, one of the invasive traits Norway maple has other than being a prolific cedar is that it can tolerate the shade of other trees. So it's shade tolerant. That's why you see Norway maple invading woodlands 
They don't stay to the edge of the wood, woods like the tree of heaven does. Tree of heaven is also a prolific cedar, can grow almost any place. I see it on Route 9 when I come home from the club at the Parker Street Bridge growing underneath the bridge on the abutment right there. Um, tree of heaven is shade intolerant. It cannot stand shade. It needs a lot of sun. So you'll find tree of heaven in parking lot edges usually or along um, the edges of trails or in open fields. And I know Catherine Howard has been working on trying to get rid of the tree of heaven in the open space where she's trying to create a garden in Cold Spring Park. Uh, so both of these invasive trees uh, are very prolific cedars also, but because one's tolerant of shade and the other one is not, you find them distributed in the woods a little differently. The worst one is Norway maple uh, because you cannot hold it back because it can tolerate uh, deep shade as well as partial shade. Here is the end of my street. I live in Newton Highlands and um, uh, the dark green is all Norway maple and the center tree is a black oak uh, and you can see that the Norway maple, this is probably sometime in May, uh, has fully leafed out and is green and undergoing photosynthesis at full tilt and the black oak uh, is just starting to green up and unfurl its leaves. So that's a, um, a good trait of these invasives. They push out their leaves earlier, a lot of them do, before our native species. Even if it's only by a couple of weeks, it still gives them an, an advantage. Here's a little building at the country club where Tree of Heaven is growing out of the side of the um, cellar or, or the, the foundation. Uh, Tree of Heaven, as a lot of people know, is the model tree for this book cover. Uh, a tree grows in Brooklyn, I think it is. It's an old book. And um, has these compound leaves, very fast grower, tremendous root system. And um, they were brought to this country as a shade tree for farmers and for uh, arboretums and so on and so forth, because they could grow fast and create a lot of shade. So farmers could take a rest while they're working uh, in a close by uh, tree of heaven. Uh, whereas, you know, some of these oak trees may take many years to cast shade. These trees grow very fast and um, they can create shade for you pretty quickly. This is a uh, tree of heaven. If you can still hear me, tree of heaven growing out of a um, stone wall where I work. And so they'll take root almost anywhere. <laughs> and this is a good identification characteristic. It's, it's a compound leaf and it's made up of these little leaflets. And each little mini leaf has a bump, two bumps on either side of the base of the leaf and they're called leaf glands. And um, as when, a lot of people confuse this tree when it's small with uh, sumac, but sumac has a serrated or saw-like saw -like leaf edge and no leaf bumps or leaf glands. Tree of Heaven has a smooth leaf margin, but has these two characteristic bumps at the bottom of the leaf. All right. So those are the two trees that give us a lot of problems. These are the shrubs that really uh, cause us to have all these big volunteer groups <laughs> to try to rid the Newton of all these kinds of uh, invasive shrubs. So number one is glossy buckthorn, uh, two multiflora rows, bush honeysuckles, winged euonymus, Japanese barberry, the European buckthorn, European barberry, and Japanese snotweed. And a lot of these are growing in people's yards and they were all sowed by the horticultural industry to beautify your, uh, your yard or your community um, and also to attract wildlife because of the berries that they uh, produce. 
Again, his glossy buckthorn with its very glossy leaves taken down at uh, Cold Spring Park. Uh, some people confuse it with a cherry. Here's Cold Spring Park again. You can see how dense and how prolific cedar it is. All those small little green leaves coming out of the leaf litter, as well as the buckthorn in front of you and the stems behind it are all glossy buckthorn. It's one of the few sites I've seen in Newton that's really inundated with this plant. And it's a great example of how an invasive shrub can overtake uh, uh, a native area. And this is the, the red maple swamp. So um, it's quite prolific down there. And it, you can see how dark the shade is uh, when you look you know, behind the, the foreground there. It creates an awful lot of shade. And again, that interrupts our native overstory from successfully seeding in. Um, this is at the club, country club. This is um, multiflora rose, and it's growing on a dead crab apple. It took over the crab apple. And multiflora rose um, is one of the first plants to leaf out. Uh, earlier in the spring. This is an early spring uh, leafer. Uh, this is probably taken in late February, early March. And you can see in the background, there's no leaves in the trees. The upper right hand corner is a, uh, a hemlock. But um, this is at one of the areas where I work and um, uh, multiflora rose has an arcing stem but if it gets onto something, it can push itself upwards. It, it's not really a vine, but it sort of acts like a vine. And that's what it's done here. So it's, it uh, started underneath this crab apple that at one time was fully in leaf. It was in the shade. <laughs> it began to germinate, take off and just grow uncontrollably. And within about 10 years, it inundated this tree repeatedly, um, shading it out and weakened it so much that the tree eventually was almost dead. Not totally dead, but almost dead. Uh, so if left un uncontrolled and to their own devices, uh, they can just slowly take out uh, a plant that you may desire. The, the apple tree was not native, obviously, but um, this is a good illustration about left unchecked that can just sort of, you know, replace the green of a desirable plant with the, with the green color of the undesirable one. Uh, this is another plant called winged euonymus. It's got these characteristic corky wings on its stems. It's uh, one of the best horticultural shrubs you can plant <laughs> uh, if you're not concerned about conservation. It's extremely durable. Euonymus is a big genus and, uh, and this winged Euonymus uh, is in Cold Spring Park um, and it turns bright red in the fall and um, it's why it's called the burning bush. All right. Uh, this is back to Cold Spring Park with a bush honeysuckle. And like uh, a lot of these exotic invasive woodies, they seem to push out their leaves a little bit earlier. This was taken on March 26, 2017 with Catherine Howard and Eric Olson. We were walking around Cold Spring. In the background, you can see snow. And none of the uh, other, the overstory obviously is not uh, even pushing any buds out, but this bush honeysuckle has already started to leaf out. Again, it's an advantage to start photosynthesizing and uh, to get a good uh, establishment in the landscape. Uh, here's a better picture of it um, with the snow in the background. So it's very cold tolerant and bush honeysuckles have shade intermediate status. So they're along a lot of the times around. They do better uh, along uh, parking lot edges or um, in like this, in this situation, this was along the trail. Um, this is uh, back in, this is Cold Spring Park. I think it's in November, close to Thanksgiving. 
Um, this is a, uh, a withering glossy buckthorn. It still has green in its leaves. So a lot of these leaves, a lot of these woodies can push out their leaves earlier than our native plants and also hold on to their leaves a little bit longer than our native plants. And they can undergo photosynthesis, especially in the fall where our trees are turning colors and starting to drop. They're still green enough in producing another, enough photosynthate in other compounds that are transported to their roots and making their roots much bigger. This is a common or European buckthorn and has a serrated leaf different from the glossy buckthorn. And um, this is a plant, a, a shrub that's, uh, I think it's dioecious, which, which means it's male and female uh, sexes are on different plants. So a lot of these buckthorns, uh, these European or common buckthorn, they seem to congregate or stay in a group. Uh, whereas glossy buckthorn um, has perfect flowers. So it only needs one uh, plant to start an invasion. The common or European buckthorn needs two plants, a male and a female. And that makes a difference when they're an invasive species that um, one only needs one plant because it has perfect flowers and it, it can reproduce, just do its thing with one plant. And this buckthorn needs a male and a female to reproduce. Uh, here's some of the uh, dark berries of the common or European buckthorn. And this is taken sort of late summer at the country club, probably in September. This is just out of a book. Um, it's one of the barberries. This is a cultivar. Um, Japanese barberry is extremely good horticultural plant. It can take pollution, you know, uh, drought. <laughs> you can run over it with your car. Uh, you can do a lot of things with it. It'll always come back. It has uh, spines or prickles on it. So not many, nothing really eats it. No animals do. They're very good looking, but they are an invasive. And this is the Japanese barberry green variety or green color. And this is taken at the club and it has these red berries. I put them in the bottom of a coffee cup with a quarter so you can get a good size, an idea for this, their size. Um, Japanese knotweed, this is in bloom in late August into mid-September. Uh, it doesn't really, doesn't spread by seeds around here that I know of. Uh, I, it spreads by this uh, corm, this root mass, and uh, they keep on putting up new shoots every year and the corms keep on getting bigger. Um, they've been planted originally a long time ago in the 40s, 50s and 60s as a living fence. And a lot of people have these in their yard. I have it in my backyard. At the end, I'll talk about how to get rid of it. Um, they planted it at the club as a living fence. Now they realize they made a mistake. So we're going after it in uh, digging it out or, or stump applicating it or spraying it uh, the foliar, uh, with a foliar herbicide. The best time to get rid of this plant if you want to use an herbicide is when it's in flower. So uh, that's when the plant is under most stress. This is a coworker. And uh, he's about six feet tall. I had him stand beside uh, Japanese knotweed right outside my greenhouse at the country club. And he's, Anthony is about six feet tall. And so this was taken on May 25th. So it goes to show you how fast uh, Japanese knotweed can grow. Again, it's a, another invasive trait of a lot of these plants, they grow very quickly, it's particularly Japanese knotweed. So um, that's a little over six feet tall and it started to push through the ground sometime in late March or early April. So it grows quite quickly. And this is it back in November. Uh, the background is the fall in November, close to Thanksgiving. And here is uh, Japanese knotweed in the foreground still with deep green color undergoing photosynthesis and getting an edge over our native plants. 
This is what it looks like down Cold Springs Park when it's dead. <laughs> it's probably taken in January. Okay, now vines that are invasive, that are problematic around here are Asiatic bittersweet vine, porcelain berry vine, and black swallowwort. So this is poor, um, Asiatic bittersweet vine. It goes around, it's, it uses other plants or itself as a scaffolding. And this is going around, I think, some older buckthorn. And um, it goes around in a clockwise uh, growth habit. It's got these characteristic red berries with these yellow coverings or calyx, I think it's called. And a lot of these uh, berries have been used in Christmas wreaths, so they advise not to do that anymore. And um, left to its own devices, it will squeeze uh, the host plant, whether the host plant is an invasive or the host plant is a native. So it's wound itself tightly around this plant. And as you can see that it, it swells where this construction is. And that means that the photosynthate made in the leaves cannot be translocated down to the roots. It sort of bunches up above the squeeze. So it weakens the host uh, plant and the host plant is a scaffold. So the host plant weakens and eventually uh, it will die. The characteristic uh, idea of um, Asiatic bittersweet vine is these orange roots. I know a lot of you are familiar if you're doing uh, volunteer work, pulling these things out of the ground or, or at your own house, you'll notice that uh, Asiatic bittersweet vine has these orange roots. So that's a nice ID feature. This vine is, was at the country club 10 years ago. I cut it out and I counted the rings and it's about 25 years old. So uh, it, was, <laughs> it was so big, I had to cut it and then let the vines hang in the overstory of the native plants for a few months before they dry out enough so you can pull them down. All right, this is, uh, uh, well, I keep on forgetting it. Porcelain berry vine. It uh, has perfect flowers, so it only needs one vine to start an invasion. It has a beautiful leaf. It's related to the grapes, the grape uh, family. Um, these are the berries it produces, and this is why it was brought over here to the United States, I think from Asia, possibly Japan, was because it's such a beautiful horticultural specimen. Um, so people really like the way it looks. And it does look really nice, but uh, it's an invasive. But the good thing about this one, it's uh, shade intolerant. So it seems to be more in open spaces where there gets a lot of sun along the edges of um, fences. We see this a lot on, on the um, border of our country club to the estates that border the club. It's all on the fences. And the country club did use this vine to cover rocks. So they have big rock, rock outcroppings and they would um, plant this vine in the sun and cover the rocks. And so use it as an ornamental, but um, it, do, it can spread into the woods. Birds feed on the berries and spread them around. Black swallowwort is uh, Catherine Howard's favorite, maybe, <laughs> um, uh, vine uh, invasive. It's a uh, shade tolerant uh, vine. It uh, can take over the understory and it can get quite dense. Um, it's hard to pull up. It breaks off at the soil surface, but it's uh, somehow messes up the life cycle of monarch butterflies that may feed on it. The, the monarchs will get uh, sickened or poisoned. Uh, so uh, it's not a good plant that way too. Now, um, the others that are frequently encountered in the landscape, uh, Japanese knotweed, gar garlic mustard, and um, garlic mustard is Catherine's favorite. That's it. Okay, garlic mustard is a, um, a shade tolerant herbaceous ground cover. And it's really a lot, uh, has spread a lot in Cold Spring Park, and I'm sure in other parts of Newton. Goutweed is a herbaceous ground cover. Uh, when I worked at Mass Audubon, it was brought into the gardens in the 1940s. 
and it basically took over the habitat sanctuary in Belmont where I used to work, uh, part, partly in the woods and mostly in this wildflower garden that they have. So we used to spend a lot of time using uh, pitchforks to try to loosen it where it's growing and hand pull it out. It's pretty hard to do. And I have used herbicide on gout weed, even straight Roundup um, that was for herbaceous plants and it didn't kill it. It only stopped it from growing. But if you use poison ivy killer on it, you will kill it. Um, gout weed grows uh, in a radial fashion. It grows in clumps. Um, so uh, you'll see a clump of it at one part of, in the woods someplace, and then you'll see another clump some other place that doesn't take over like garlic mustard does, which seems to be more of a uniform uh, uh, spreading. Now, the ecological traits of these exotic invasive plants. Okay, number one, they have a high seed production and they can last in the seed bank for a long time. No one really knows how long. Forest Service says that a lot of these plants last between one and two years in the ground. Some people that have done research on Asiatic bittersweet vine and glossy buckthorn say they can last in the, in the, in the seeds can last in the ground in some areas, maybe up to three years, three or four years. So no one really knows. It's hard. That's hard information for me to find. But I guess as they do more experiments with these plants on the university level, they'll figure their seed bank longevity out. But um, the Asiatic bittersweet vine and glossy buckthorn, winged anemonas, barberry, and all the others, they produce a huge amount of seed annually, but not all the seeds germinate. But it's just the sheer number of viable seeds produced ensures that these plants will germinate and spread rapidly. And a friend of mine, Josh Ellsworth, um, he did research on Asiatic bittersweet vine, and he basically said out of 100 bittersweet seeds, about 30 to 35 will germinate. Now, the second uh, trait that these uh, plants seem to have is they're attractive to birds. So the seed is easily dispersed by birds, wind, water, animals, and gravity. So the seeds of buckthorn, bittersweet vine, barberry, euonymus, and all the others are, are spread by birds. And Norway maple and tree of heaven they're spread by wind or gravity because they have these samaras. They, they have these whirly bird kind of uh, attachments for, to their seeds and they sort of whirly bird down to the ground. And the seeds of aquatic invasive loose strife, purple loose strife can be carried by water currents. So they do spread around not only by us transplanting these plants over the years, but they are attractive to animals and they also can spread just in nature through wind and water. Here's a good example at the country club of a white oak. And all around that white oak, it's mowed. But the mass of green you see beneath that white oak is um, uh, Ramnus uh, frangula. It's a glossy buckthorn. So a lot of turf people don't recognize these plants as being dangerous. So they treat them as, as time goes on as an ornamental plant. <laughs> and that, the, those, that group right there is spread by birds. The birds are up in the tree and poop, poop out the seeds and the seeds germinate. And since they're not hit by the mower, they just take off. And all of them can produce seed and attract more birds and continue the cycle. Um, this is another, if I can't see it, uh, it's a, uh, glossy buckthorn at the bottom of another white oak in a more formal area at the golf club. Uh, again, it's only at the base of this white oak tree because it missed the mower and it was defecated by birds that were in the tree above it. So that's how they can spread. Now the seed viability, how long they can last in sexual reproduction. So most woody invasive plant seeds can lie dormant in the soil for over one year and become part of a native seed bank or a part of our soils. They can germinate later when conditions are right. Sexual reproduction can be dioecious, which means male and female flowers are on separate plants. And that's like Asiatic bittersweet vine. 
or they can be monoecious where the male and female flowers are on the same plant. And that's what most of these plants are, are monoecious, where monoecious male and female on the same plant means only one plant is can start an invasion. Another form of, of monoecious condition, I'd say, is having perfect flowers where male and female reproductive parts are in the same flower on the same plant. Um, vegetative reproduction, so some of these exotic woodies, such as the buckthorns and winged euonymus, tree of heaven, you know, Asiatic bittersweet vine, they can sprout from stumps when they're cut. Now, if they're, uh, well, others can, when cut, can sprout from roots. Uh, so Japanese knotweed sprouts from its thick root mass called rhizomes. Um, Japanese uh, uh, knotweed, uh, let me see, yeah, it just sprouts from the rhizomes. What I want to say about the, if you cut these woodies, like say buckthorn, for example, an Asiatic bittersweet vine, and you don't apply uh, an herbicide to the freshly cut stump, then you create a real havoc. For example, glossy buckthorn, which has perfect flowers, if you cut one, one stump, it can send up more sprouts with perfect flowers than the uncut buckthorn two or three feet away. So cutting these plants and then not either taking them out of the ground or applying an herbicide uh, really does not help out at all. You're creating more of a problem. Uh, a lot of these uh, plants also uh, have certain um, characteristics such as physical structures, spines or prickles that deter grazing animals from touching them. A good example is the barberry shrubs. I've seen uh, Japanese barberry up in Arcadia Park, Maine that the forest rangers were pulling out that were not grazed upon by um, deer, you know. So, and other plants produce chemical compounds that are unpalatable to plant feeding animals. So I have Japanese stiltgrass and I put in add more here, but what that means is eat, you don't find any animals in deer or even feeding on buckthorn. So they probably find that the plants have, uh, you know, an, un, an untasty kind of uh, phenomenon going on. They don't really find them tasty at all. <clears throat> so that allows them to proliferate and stay in our native landscape. Now, the timing of leaf out and leaf loss, I've touched on a little bit. Some of these plants gain an edge over our natives by leafing out earlier in the spring and they hold on to their leaves longer in the fall. This enables the invasive to carry out photosynthesis. This is really important. Just a little bit longer than our native plants, allowing the invasives to store more carbohydrates or energy in their roots. And so if they have more carbohydrate or energy in their roots, they're sure to you know, proliferate in the spring, push out their leaves more successfully, even if it's a droughty spring. So, you know, you keep them in the landscape for many years and don't do anything about them and they're undergoing all this, um, they just have an advantage. And again, it takes decades for you to see the damage. Now the time of year fruiting and duration. So a lot of these invasives set fruit at different times, not just in the fall. So many produce seeds and fruits longer than our native plants. So a good example is winged euonymus in Asiatic bittersweet vine fruits between July and through October, glossy buckthorn from June through September in multiflora rose goes from July through August and fruits can linger on on multiflora rose throughout the winter. Uh, so those are long fruiting times, uh, longer than what our native plants do. So as long as they're in fruit um, and they're ready to have birds and other animals feed on them, it's a longer feeding period for all of our native birds to chew on these things and spread them around. And uh, then eight, eight is uh, the trait is shade and light tolerance. So seedlings and established and invasive plants with the shade tolerant trait, such as glossy buckthorn, winged euonymus, uh, Asiatic bittersweet vine, garlic mustard, they can, 
uh, germinate and become established in shady areas. Now they really like to get established in sunny areas, but they can germinate in shaded areas. As we can see in the earlier slide of cold spring, uh, red maple swamp of all, all that glossy buckthorn. So don't be fooled, I say. Shade tolerant species can grow rapidly when the shade opens up in the overstory due to any tree, die, tree branch dieback or breakage of in fallen limbs. So if you wanna compare shade and light tolerances, shade intolerant plants that are native are usually referred to as pioneer species. And these need full sun for growth and development. Shade for pioneer species, such as some cherry trees and some uh, birches, shade is a limiting factor. All right, but native shade intolerant trees, as an example, are eastern red cedar, pin cherry, sassafras, paper birch, tamarack, aspens, you know, those kinds of trees. However, sh invasive shade intolerant tree and vine is tree of heaven and porcelainberry vine. So porcelainberry vine and tree of heaven, you can say sort of acts like a pioneer species, our native trees that we call pioneer species. And if they're shade intolerant, they're only gonna grow where the sun is. Now other tolerance ratings are shade intermediate, or sometimes the Forest Service calls them mid-tolerant plants. They, they need sun, but can tolerate partial shade. Now, a lot of our native trees are shade intermediate. Those, these are the red, white, and black oaks, shagbark hickory, example, bitternut hickory, butternut, black birch, um, eastern white pine, black cherry, black ash, red pine. Uh, and I put down close to being full shade tolerant, but listed in this category of being shade intermediate is red maple. So even within these shade tolerance ratings, whether they're shade intolerant or they're intermediate or they're tolerant, there's a range within those three groups. Uh, so it's not written in stone, let's say. The shade intermediate ones, if they're um, native shade shrubs or native, inter native shade intermediate shrubs are viburnum, witch hazel, winterberry, and huckleberry. However, the invasive shade intermediate shrubs are the Japanese barberry, common barberry, bush honeysuckles, and um, Japanese knotweed. Now, the reason why I put this in here is because a lot of our woodlands are, are composed of native shade intermediate overstory trees oaks and hickories and stuff like that. And a lot of sun does hit the forest floor. Now, if you have a, an invader that's also shade intermediate, um, it can colonize that uh, native forest floor and create a condition that's too shady and interrupt the germination of the shade intermediate native overstory. So this is why this is important. Um, it's not really talked about in books, but uh, you have to dig for this information. And I had to do that with forestry books. <laughs> now we have shade tolerant plants. These species can tolerate full shade, which is low light conditions. It can grow in the shade of other species as well as their own. And we see that with hemlock. And we see that with um, our native um, sugar maples and beech. Um, they can grow and create a grove and, um, and live there for hundreds of years. Um, now, shade tolerant plants can grow in full sun when there's adequate soil moisture during the germination, seedling and sampling stage. But sunlight is not a limiting factor when it's a shade tolerant plant. Sunlight is a limiting factor for pioneer species and for shade intolerant plants, but sunlight is not a limiting factor when a, a uh, plant is shade tolerant. All right, native and, in, and invasive shade tolerant plants. So I'm gonna compare them all on oh, some of the ma major ones. The native shade tolerant trees are Eastern hemlock, sugar maple, American beech, basswood, 
balsam fir up in Maine and a few others. The shade tolerant invasive tree again is Norway maple. That's why it invades the woodlands in Newton. It's all through the woods. <laughs> and the invasive shrubs that are shade tolerant are glossy buckthorn, which you see down the red maple swamp in cold spring, common buckthorn, winged euonymus, multiflora rose. And invasive shade tolerant vine is Asiatic bittersweet vine. And of course, Catherine's favorite, the invasive shade tolerant herb is garlic mustard. Now just um, these invasives that are shade tolerant, Norway maple and the shrubs and the vines have caused so much havoc in our native uh, landscapes all throughout Eastern Massachusetts, up into New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont. And they're slowly gaining more, uh, more of a purchase, I guess, into our native landscapes because of this one trait. Now, the, tr the trait is the shade tolerant trait. If, if all these were shade intolerant, they wouldn't be that bad because they're all prolific seeders. So if you combine prolific seeding with being vectored by birds and then this shade tolerant trait, it really makes a very effective pest. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to hit home here. So shade tolerance counts. Most of the exotic invasive woody plant species are in the shade intermediate and shade tolerant categories. This is why they are very successful at invading our native woodlands. The shade intolerant or sun loving species are confined to the edges or openings in woodlands. All right, exotic invasive woody plants have a broad range of soil and site conditions. Uh, that's another trait, let's say a trait of the seed. And, uh, and one thing I've noticed, and I'm sure a lot of you have, is a lot of these species can tolerate prolonged drought longer than some natives of the same age and or size. And a good example of that is the John Brewer restaurant in Waltham uh, has a lot of uh, winged euonymus in their parking lot edges. And for years, when I used to pass it going off to Belmont to the habitat sanctuary, um, when I worked there, I noticed that some summers they were, they, they, they looked like they died. They dropped all of their leaves, these uh, winged euonymus shrubs, and they were looked like sticks. It was during some major droughts. And sure enough, the following spring, they came back as if nothing ever happened. So um, I know for just through observation that um, uh, some of these species and glossy buckthorn too, at the country club, they're wilting in the woods they have in the past, but the following year they come back pretty strong. So there's something going on with their metabolism that they can do that. All right, now control methods are hand pulling using a weed wrench, repeated cutting or mowing. We'll do that for some of these, not all of them do that. Uh, I, won't, you, I don't use that technique for everything. And then herbicide applications, which is stump application and a foliar application. And the best time to do that is July up to mid-September if you're doing a uh, foliar ap application. Um, stump application can be done anytime from July through February. And that's called winter stump application of herbicide, number five. And I say you can do that, you know, anytime. But if you want to, if you just want to stick to the winter, November through February is best. And there's a thing called buckthorn baggies, which is used in wetlands and we've used them at Cold Spring Park and other areas. I think Catherine used them a lot. And you uh, cut this, uh, let's say a buckthorn down to about six inches and you put the specialized black bag over it with a, with a tie at the bottom so no light can come in. And it sort of starves the, the, the uh, living stump of light. And it sort of thinks in quotation marks that it's uh, in the dark and you have to leave them on for a year before the, um, the cut stump will die. But these are, I've heard uh, are used in wetlands where you can't use herbicides. So it's a good technique. Here's a buddy of mine at the club demonstrating hand pulling. Even though he's pulling out an oak, he's a pretty strong guy. That's Alberto. <laughs> and this is a, um, 
a weed wrench is what it looks like. They don't make this anymore. Uh, but they have a, a comparable one called the root puller, I think it's called, or oh, the uprooter. That's what it's called. It's a white, it's a white weed wrench. This is an orange weed wrench in the original weed wrench design uh, and tool. Uh, it has these jaws, you clasp it and you pull back and you can yank it right out of the ground. And I, most of the invasives I've worked on in 20 years has been hand pulling and then, then using a weed wrench. And only about 5% of the time I use stump application. And uh, that's Alberto posing. And then um, that's the guys doing a demonstration for me. And then we have a power pole pruner, a gas powered hedge trimmer on a pole. And I like to use this uh, for cutting into vines in cutting down Japanese knotweed. And you use uh, back and forth motions to cut it. So you cut it down every six inches to a f every 12 inches and keep on going back and forth, back and forth and make a mess on the ground so you can rake it up uh, and take it away. Or if it's cuts into small pieces, it just decomposes better. And then um, the, the typical uh, hand pruners, uh, all different sizes and shapes and costs and brands. These are the ones that I use in the uh, folding uh, arbor saw. So those are, those are the tools. That's about it. Nothing special. Occasionally I cut myself into a mass of vines using these head shears and sometimes loppers with a very large Asiatic bittersweet vine. Um, this is uh, a good example of glossy buckthorn cut in the early summer. I let it re-sprout and you can see those smaller sprouts coming from that cut stump. And then I stump applicate it with an herbicide uh, Roundup Poison Ivy Killer. I put a dye in it so you can see it. And the reason why I did it that way, some people say it's double work, but at least I can cut the plant during the you know, early summer, force it to use its root reserves to put out more um, stems and leaves and then stump applicate it later. And that really is assures you that just that one time you apply the herbicide, you'll kill the plant. And uh, these are all were done that way. Previously cut and let them re-sprout and then uh, use the herbicide when you cut the stump lower and just do it with a um, little handsaw there. And you can see that is common or European buckthorn. And this was taken in November or early December and it's still sprouting, <laughs> as you can see. Not doing a good job, but it goes to show you the power these plants have as compared to our natives. If you cut a native during this time, it would not sprout until the following year. And you can stump applicate, um, this is glossy buckthorn, when it gets embedded into a native uh, oak tree like this has. And um, when you use an herbicide like uh, Roundup, the Roundup will be translocated down into the root, but it won't translocate to the, um, to the native plant or any other plant. It just stays in the root where you apply to, to, the, to the plant you apply it to. So um, there are a lot of herbicides that don't do that, but Roundup does. So this was Roundup Poison Ivy Killer with a, um, a red dye in it for demonstration purposes. Uh, yeah, cut it, killed that uh, uh, glossy buckthorn that was competing with this white oak and, um, and nothing happened to the oak. And, Eventually, this was taken 10 years ago, that buckthorn stump rotted away. And here again is a technique where you cut and clear first, remove all the buckthorn earlier in the year, let it re-sprout, and then you can go in and cut those stumps really low because you're forcing them to push out and use their root reserves. And this is done in the fall. All right, so coming to the end, website resources. Uh, there's the Invasive Plant Atlas of New England. Uh, there's the Invasive and Exotic Species of North America. Uh, TNC uh, uh, Wildland Weeds. And then 
The government is the plants.usda.gov. If everybody wants a copy of these things, I can send it to them in an email. And uh, Ecological Landscape Alliance, uh, I've written a lot of fact sheets for them. I'm on the board of directors of this Ecological Landscape Alliance. Uh, so um, I can send you some stuff too. And then the Forest Service, and this is a, uh, a really good website. It goes into the biology and con uh, of these um, all these invasives and it's a hard to find website but it's there and it's very big and uh, if anybody wants a copy of this uh, later on I can uh, give it to you and uh, there'll be no problem at all so don't worry about that and then books for ID and descriptions so you have a Brooklyn Botanic Garden has these nice little picture books with great descriptions on invasive plants this is a great book covers all the real basic ones in our area. Uh, and then the one that New England Wildflower Society produces is also really good. You can buy that up there and up in uh, Framingham where they are. It's a nice color book uh, booklet and um, great photos and great descriptions. And then to the first one, Invasive Plants from Brooklyn Botanic Garden, the uh, companion book is this native alternatives to invasive plants. So if you like invasive plants, sort of like uh, winged euonymus, this native alternative to invasive plants will tell you the natives that will complement the uh, exotic. And a lot of landscape designers will rely on this book. If you don't know how to identify shrubs in their native, uh, or uh, trees. This guy, George W.D. Simmons, wrote this book back in the 50s. It's so popular at colleges and universities, it's still in print. So you can get this on Amazon.com, but the Shrub Identification Book has all black and white photographs of buds, leaves, stems, bark, everything. So it can really, if you go to Cold Spring, you'll cut a few shrub twigs. You don't know what it is. This book, you can narrow it down pretty quickly. And he also has written this tree identification book. Uh, it's a, These two books are excellent uh, for matching up with photographs, the tree or shrub you want to identify. And then another book is um, Eastern Trees, the United States Peterson Field Guide. Uh, these are great too. I use all these books. I don't use just one. And then this is an old copy that's still in print, uh, Fruit and Key Twig, Fruit Key and Twig Key. It gives, uh, shows the fruits in twigs and buds of a lot of our native plants. So um, a lot of foresters use this. And I learned about it 30 years ago when I was a forestry major at first at UMass. So this is, this, that was a good little book that everyone relied on. Uh, if you need more information, you can take down my email address and email me anytime. Just say um, you took this webinar and um, I don't care if it's a week from now or five years from now. Um, just identify who you are, who you are and what this question is. If I can't identify, if I can't answer it, I'll, I'll find out who can answer it for you. So uh, I think that's it. I think I made it through pretty good. Okay. That was awesome, Bruce. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the information we need to help understand invasives in our open spaces. So thank you for that. And now let's go to questions. We have a lot of questions and comments. The very first one we got from was from Seth, who wanted us to know that the tree of heaven has an absolutely awful smell. How did he put it? A distinctive, strong smell, somewhat repulsive. So that's another good ID <laughs> characteristic. It's also good if any of you have seen the conservators uh, program we co-sponsor with the library on the lanternfly. Uh, the lanternfly has the tree of heaven as its host tree. So they are an absolutely delightfully awful pair. So that's a comment to start with, but now, now we'll get to the questions. Uh, Bruce, Catherine, who if you may have heard Bruce referring to Catherine, Catherine is the conservators, the leader of the conservators invasive team. 
and she's wonderful. And so she, that, that's why Bruce referred to her frequently. And she has a question here. She uh -oh. wants to know how people out in, in our open space can distinguish porcelain berry from uh, native grape. All right, at this time of the year, you'll see the, um, the berries on it, but um, you're gonna have to buy a, that um, shrub identification book by Simmons. And you're going to have to compare porcelain berry to regular grape. There isn't, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but porcelain berry has like a three lobe to leave. And it has a lot of what I call smaller veins in the leaf that gives it a puckered appearance. And, um, and you have to compare it to a regular grape leaf that um, some of the grapes I think may have more lobes to them and be, be more pointed, but it is best to compare them both in real life or in one of those, or in the Simmons book on shrub ID. That's an old book. Um, that's the best I can do right now. If I was down Cold Springs, I could show it, show you. But. <laughs> I also think that if you look at the stem, the porcelain berry has lenticels and the grape doesn't and it's a little more shaggy and the if you break the stem in pieces the pith of the porcelain berry is white and the pith of the grape is brown oh excellent okay thanks <laughs> that's good she, she gets us on technical questions <laughs> uh before we ask she's got a couple more stored up for us but let's get to a question that seems to be a concern to a number of people in a variety of ways uh, i'm going to try to get the exact wording of the first one uh elaine says it is very concerning that you are using herbicides like roundup do you know of safer alternatives which safer alternatives have you used and then someone later says do organic herbicides not work? Roundup is so toxic. Yeah, unfortunately, the organic um, herbicides, um, from what I've been told by people who have used them, um, is only kills the top of the plant, and not the root. They don't get translocated down to the root. Um, Roundup and other herbicides get translocated down to the root to kill the plant. Um, Non-toxic ways of of uh, killing then would be hand pulling, weed wrenching, or um, uh, using those buckthorn baggies. They can be used on other woody plants, not just buckthorn. But this is a really common question because an awful lot of people have a difficulty with the physicality of removing invasive plants. Uh, it's it's incredibly uh, strenuous to do uh, to pull these things out and. And uh, it, it causes an awful lot of, um, this is one of the reasons why invasives are not really that popular. People want to learn about them and know about them, but very few people will actually continue to volunteer with them because it's very hard to do it organically, which is pull them out. But as, as when it comes to organic compounds, to this date, I don't know of any organic liquid compound, an herbicide or organic herbicide that will kill a woody invasive successfully. It has to be translocated down to the root. And that's what these um, synthetic uh, herbicides do. But Roundup, like I said, 5% of the time I do stump cutting and, you know, and applying the herbicide. I usually do that in the winter. Um, so it's directed with a cellulose sponge applicator directly to the freshly cut stump. And if you do it in the winter, if it doesn't fall below like 18 or 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you can kill that plant in place. And uh, if you use a cellulose sponge um, tool, which you can get off forestry suppliers, you don't get any of the herbicide on yourself and it will not drip into the environment. So um, I know a lot of people don't like using herbicides and I don't either. Um, I, I, most of the work I've done in my life has been hand pulling and uh, weed wrenching and only 5% of the time it's been stump application. So I used to foliar spray uh, plants, but um, I don't do that because it goes all over the place. So uh, past 15 years, I just stump applicate, but I don't have a, I wish I had that magic 
uh, compound, but I, I know organic compounds kill the top of the plant, but doesn't really translocate down to the roots. So if anybody does know a, a safer alternative, uh, that'll be good for me to know too. Well, what biologist Eric Olson always says too, is that there is so much Roundup used indiscriminately in agriculture that that is what's really destroying the environment. And that if that were limited, then in the very safe, uh, safe, relatively safe uh, way of doing stump application, we could use it to help save the environment. So mm -hmm. that's his take on it as much as it is a toxic and miserable substance. Uh, okay, more questions. Oh, we've got so many questions here, how to choose. Uh, Seth asks, I have a couple of thickets of tree of heaven growing very fast on the edge of the conservation wetland behind my house. How do I dispose of the trees after they are cut? There's a lot of material, too much to bag. Well, it depends when they're cut. If, if you have the, the seeds, which are probably out now, um, if, you, if you cut it in the spring before it flowers and goes into seed, um, and you can cut it up and get rid of it that way. Um, my advice though with a lot of people is um, you may not have access to a wood chipper, but anytime you cut any of these trees or shrubs down, even if they're in the, the berry stage or the seed stage, just the trauma of it going through a wood chipper screws up the seeds enough that they can't germinate. Um, so there's very little germination coming out of a wood chipper. <laughs> um, but the best you could do is um, a tree of heaven. Um, my advice would be just to, just to go at it and cut it up as much as you can. And then you can let the rot logs rot in the ground uh, if you'd like. It's not a very, uh, let's say it's a tree that has weak wood. So it's... Uh, it doesn't has a lot of high water content in it, so it's it it will rot pretty fast as compared to an oak tree. But uh, you can also call an arborist if you want to spend some money and um, have him just wood chip it. Uh, so that's the best I can do, I think. <laughs> go on one of the conservators volunteer sessions and ask Catherine to give you one of her wonderful examples of how you tie up <laughs> the four foot long stems in bundles that you can haul out too. Uh, at least you don't waste bags that way, but it's still a lot to transport. Mm. We have two more questions about uh, using app stump application. And two different substances, one tree of heaven and one in Asiatic bittersweet, they were both cut about a month ago. Is it too late to apply an herbicide to them at this point? Okay, um, you have to recut the stump. So if they've been cut, you have to go a little bit below that cut and make a fresh cut and then apply the herbicide directly to that freshly cut stump. A lot of people think that you can cut them and then go back several hours later or a few days later, that really won't work. It's not consistent killing of the, of the, of the plant or the targeted plant. So the best to do it, it would be um, to just to scrape, you know, I don't know how low they've cut it, but if you can cut it a little bit lower and then apply the uh, herbicide um, and you can do it, uh, you know, it can't be any rain around for 24 hours and you can do it any time in the winter also. So uh, I have an, an article I'll gladly mail out to people or mail out to you, Beth, and you can group mail it. Yeah, on, on uh, stump application um, for, for in, during the winter. And a lot of uh, people do that now because it's less contamination and you can see the plants and uh, you don't have to compete with ticks and, <laughs> and that kind of stuff. But you have to recut it to make it a fresh wound and then apply it. Uh, Cause these plants, once you cut them, they start to scab over. You don't see the scab, but internally um, the uh, wood sort of walls off and prevents anything from coming into the freshly cut area. So you got to recut it and then apply. 
We, we have a question about what happens to the Roundup in the roots after the plant dies. It degrades on its own. Uh, some people say, I think it's, if I remember a long time ago, part of, of the degradation of Roundup is um, physically breaking down in the soil or in the root. And then it may be, be fed upon during the, the breakdown process by microbes. So uh, it's a sort of a long process, um, but it's both a biological breakdown of some of these compounds as well as a physical breakdown. So once it kills the plant, it just stays in place and it will eventually get broken down and get, I don't know what they call it, it sort of gets uh, taken apart. And it's not, it's not the, the pot, doesn't have the potency anymore. And that's why Roundup is so popular because it will not spread. There's a, there's a uh, compound called Tordon, which is a very powerful herbicide used a lot on some golf courses in the past. If you stump applicate or foliar applicate with that, it will stay in the ground for 20 more years and kill other plants. But Roundup doesn't do that. So, well, thank you. We, we are running out of time and there's still questions. Okay, uh, what to choose? We have several people who seem very interested in Norway maples. And uh, Patty asks, do you happen to know, is Newton planning interested in removing the invasive Norway maples from our streets? I don't know about that. You have to ask um, Derek Mannion. <laughs> or Mark uh, Welch. Actually, I- Mark Welch, I'm, yeah. Because I'm on the tree commission, I, I know a little bit, three okay. quarters of our street trees uh, in Newton are Norway maples. So I think the plan is for there to be a succession. A lot of them are starting to die. And Mark Welch, when he plans what streets, I mean, it's illegal to plant the Norway maples anymore. Uh, so he is replacing them with a variety of other trees. Uh, that said, for a tree, I would, what I say, they're they're not good, but they do what a tree needs to do, right? They soak up groundwater, they provide shade, they give us oxygen. So it's a, it's a, hard, it's a hard situation to deal with this point into having that many trees in our city uh, be Norway maples. Maybe they should focus on going to the wooded areas and just cutting them down. And yes. <laughs> and that, you know what, a lot of us, I think, need to get together to have, it, this isn't a good year with the money situation after COVID, but to having more money and more energy spent in our open areas. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, let's, let's who gets the last question of the night? Uh, Mary, oh, it's going to two. Mariana says that she's used landscape fabric and 12 inches of mulch over the landscape fabric on areas with extensive garlic mustard and it has worked. So that is nice to know. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, um, my personal opinion is that's really incredible effort. And, and, it, and it works. <laughs> That's pretty cool. But um, it, since garlic mustard is a biennial, if you cut it before it flowers, it won't come back. So um, I know a lot of us pull it out. Um, I have an article about that also if people wants to know, if they want to know about it. But if you can just cut it with one of those scythes, those golf club styled scythes, I guess they call them, and just cut it. Um, the, it, the second year, now the first year is just a rosette on the ground. The second year, it sends up a, a stem, cut that stem and um, uh, right before it flowers. And uh, uh, that, that, that should be sufficient. And uh, maybe Catherine Howard has a different, uh, she has a lot of experience with that, uh, not cutting, but I mean with the, the plant uh, completely. So, but that's what I've done in the past at my job and a little bit with cold, in Cold Springs with Catherine, and it, and I got that technique out of a journal article, and it and it works. So um, the seeds will always be in the seed bank, and they can always come back. So her, the lady who just smothers everything, she's really um, smothering those seeds. Uh, but who knows how long those seeds can last in the soil? Some of our agricultural seeds have a seed bank lifespan between 10 and 80 years. Wow. So, yeah, a long, wow. long time. So I don't know where garlic mustard falls in. 
place into that. But that's a great effort that that lady's doing. And uh, she's probably is suffocating uh, a lot of the seeds more than she knows. And plus an awful lot of amateurs like us are finding out an awful lot about invasive plants by working with them that researchers really don't know. So if anybody has a technique that works, that doesn't mean that the book is right and you're wrong. A lot of books have techniques of removing things and have their own recipes. But if you find a technique that works, that means you're also right. And you can add your technique to everybody else's technique that's printed. Let's hear it for citizen science, right? R right, exactly. <laughs> Well, there are more questions here that are so good that we're not going to have time to get to. I encourage, as Bruce did, for any of you to write to him at bwenning at verizon.net. We will, a few days from now, we'll send up, out a message to everyone that will include that and will include some of the resources that Bruce suggested. This has been amazing, Bruce. It's really great. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for all your wealth of knowledge and sharing it with us. All right. Thank you. That was and fun. <laughs> it is fun. Uh, uh, learning is great. Right. And thank you to the participants who've been here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.